one of the things I wanted to to cover with you that thinking about to the forums all the mm -hmm. way back and and something that's come to come to light now. I remember, and I swear this in the early two thousands, osteopontin coming oh, yeah. up as a topic as a potential hair growth stimulant, and you know the you know as as I've followed it online. You know, I'm I'm looking at I think it is the the product which is you know a derivative that's of osteopontin. Yeah. You know that the company I think it was Follicum was going to F O L zero zero five is basically that they took what they felt was the active component to it. And they've been working on getting it approved, and I know that there's some some new chatter around that. And then I'm yeah you know, I'm looking at the research from Max Plikus. Again, viewing the videos, seeing some of his presentations, you know, reviewing at least the the synopsis of the article and seeing what Amplifica is pursuing, you know, they're pursuing actual osteopontin as opposed to Scube 3, which all the hype, you know, came out around. And I'm just saying to myself, I'm like, does Max Plikus know about Follicum? <laughs> does <it> take, like... <laughs> And does Follicum know about what Max Plikus is up to? Like, it just seems like this treatment, it, it's either going to be a, a dud, a complete dud. Like, it's either got its own set of problems around molecular weight and deliverability and chemical stability and and just, you know, the, the possibility of it working. But I mean, that's that's what they're, you know, Amplifica, they're studying first. Is they're looking at osteopontin straight away, and they're they're skipping scube three. From my understanding on things, is you know kind of what is you know what is your understanding for, you know what FOL zero zero five, how that might be different. You know I've seen some interviews online, and just you know it, it's it's almost like Amplifica is following the going down this path, and I'm not sure I'm not really sure where they wind up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I in mean, terms of, like, I, I honestly, uh, the whole thing about Scoop 3, I'm not even sure if they're in clinical trials yet. Maybe I could be wrong, but the last time I heard, they were trying to set up a some sort of phase one kind of clinical trial with Scoop 3. Um, I admittedly I haven't seen any sort of update regarding Scoop 3 or osteopatin. I'm not entirely sure, um, but when I look at AMP3, I think it's AMP303 from Amplifica. I think it's likely a distinct molecule separate from osteopotin, and this molecule could very well be scoop 3. So when used alongside osteopotin, maybe scoop 3 has the potential to enhance hair growth signaling significantly. I'm not entirely sure on that. But looking at FOL005 from Follicum, it might function in... Another way analogous to Scoop 3, boosting osteopotin expression and maybe consequently stimulating hair follicle growth effectively. But I, again, I'm not entirely too sure about that. I'm not sure how they're going about signaling the hair follicle to actually activate, I guess, dormant hair follicles to actually activate here. But I would think that it's Scoop 3 induces osteopotin and then that leads to positive gro growth factors for the hair follicle. That's for the Amplifica kind of research pipeline. And then for Follicum, it would be the FOL005, I think it's a like, peptide or whatever. That specific molecule stimulates the expression of osteopotin, or maybe it's some sort of osteopotin adjacent kind of molecule that can signal to the hair follicle to actually grow. But yeah, it seems kind of convoluted this entire thing. Read read this because it it AMP two oh three is is what they're leading with in terms of studying. They're not leading with scoop three as as part of the compound highlighted in nature publications designated as AMP two oh three at Amplifica perplicus is an wow. osteopontin based compound that is under preclinical development. Amplifica will be initiating clinical development program to evaluate the safety of its core in the calendar of 2023. Amplifica is in the early stages of clinical development. This this was a while back. They were actually in some subsequent. Yeah, this was in June. I had seen some things as late as the fall. This where, fall, where they yeah th that they're 
clinical trial was going to be wrapping up in quarter one, 2024. Oh, for so it. they already had the clinical trial for um, osteopathy. They are. Needles are being and in, were injected into people. <laughs> and they were, it was a fa- full on phase two because I think Dr. Rassman was a part of that. Um, and he did, he did a brief interview, interview where I saw something. He also did a more extensive interview with Gary Linkoff, Dr. Linkoff in New York City. Mm-hmm. And I think he got into that a little bit about them being that far along. He he didn't sound, you know, he wasn't hyping it up as the next great thing. But I was, I don't know, I was just kind of surprised by it. So I'll be interested as you delve into it a little bit more and as if, if I can share some more information with you. Definitely, where, yeah. I'll have yeah. to look, I'll have to look more into uh, into this. Because from my understanding, the last time I looked, I thought they were still going through with Scoop 3, but it looks like they kind of uh, silently uh, switched. So it's kind of interesting. Now, is it that Osteopotin activates Scoop 3? or? or... I think what they found in the Nature article... Ah, yeah, I, I think I... Let's see. Look tools. Yeah. yeah, I can't remember where I had read it. I'd have to go back, but yeah, they just I something about it they felt, you know, was maybe stimulatory of existing follicles um versus where Scube 3 really talked about forming new ones. And maybe they saw something, just again, my pure speculation, <laughs> you know, that because Scube 3 is is identified at some level with cancer development, yeah. and maybe osteopon simply, you know, safer, more stimulatory of existing follicles versus, hey, we're trying to build entirely new mini organs in your skin. <laughs> from, from my understanding, I think... Uh... Scoop three is supposed to stimulate some, I guess, the positive growth factors of the uh, the Wnt pathway. I would have to look back into this because it's been a while since I actually looked at Scoop three. But there was this whole talk of using Scoop three to transform resting hair follicles into active ones. So, yeah, you know, there's this. People say that you know, even on bald scalps or parts of the scalp that you know haven't been growing for a while, you do have dormant hair follicles and there could be a way to kind of stimulate them and turn them, you know, into, into growing um, hairs once again. And I guess one of the pathways they, or molecules that they've discovered was the, the Scoop 3, in this case, the human variant, because I'm pretty sure Scoop 3 already exists, uh, already existed prior to this. This wasn't like any sort of unique discovery of like a new molecule. They just found out that this particular molecule has a purpose in regulating, partially regulating hair follicle development. But but yeah, I have to I would have to look more into this because I haven't heard that much news from Scoop Three or Doctor Maxim Plicus. Yeah, I I have a feeling that we'll hear something probably by the summer if if this was you know positive in terms of it. But I think in in rereading this again, they talk about it being an osteopotent based compound. It is answer. So oh, based compound. Maybe. So not necessarily osteopotent. Yep. So, yeah, I find that... Find so that is Scoop 3 an osteopotent based compound? I is think it... it's separate. I think it's it's seen as a protein all, okay. all together on its own. Oh, and man, again, I wish it's... they were more clear in these, uh, these articles, these yeah. news articles. Yeah. I feel like I want to enroll in one of his classes. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's, well, he's at Irvine, right? <laughs> yeah. You... <laughs> Yes, I'm going to do a remote learning. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to just <laughs> quiz them nonstop. <laughs> like, Honestly, I would get out of here. I, I would definitely like try to reach out to him if I'm able to, just to see if, I mean, it would be cool to have him on just to see, you know, what he thinks or, or what he can share about um the clinical trials. Because I'm pretty sure, did he, I'm, I'm not sure how it's working out. Did they sell the... Uh, these findings to Amplifica? Is he on the Amplifica team? Was he just working at UC Irvine? I, for, I kind of forgot the lore behind uh, the, this uh, particular discovery. Yeah, well, well, I guess they they worked with a company to form Amplifica because they had to spin it out of the university 
and Dr. Rassman, you know, he is on the board with them. So he's an early investor and advisor. And Plakus is like the head of, you know, the medical. So it's kind of like, okay, we're separating this from the university as its own thing. Now we can go out and we can get funding. And they've done at least one or two rounds of funding. So it's the same key people that are involved just under Amplifica as opposed to doing it through university. And my understanding, that's that's a lot of how this biotechnology is, you know, developed and set up is that basically a firm will help you get it started. So it, it seems to have happened so quickly that they knew that they had something that was looking good. And it's like Amplifica was boom, formed. Yeah, set. they're really pushing for and it. We have, by the way, we're rolling, yeah, we're rolling right into preclinical development. Like we think that this is this is gonna move. That it's the confidence in which and the science and technology that they use to arrive at the point of understanding these, you know, different, you know, chemicals roles, you know, these molecules and what they do, that it's like, hey, you know. It, even if this isn't a home run, we need to set up because we're going to find the next round of things that are really going to do it. You know, so that that's my take. But I just, you know, the entire follicum, like, are they just going to say, "Look, we're outclassed here. <laughs> I think we're just going to we're just going to pack it in because we just we don't have a deliverable." Or are they just going to charge ahead? Which, again, I've read some things online that makes it seem like they're gonna they're going to move ahead with it. Um, just be really curious to see how that plays out. To me, it speaks to the confidence in which, uh, you know, somebody feels like they have something and his his background and, and otherwise. And the team that they put together is, really seems pretty impressive. Yeah, definitely. That's, you know, what would this be, like a growth stimulant or Cause if it's regenerating uh, hair follicles, that's, that's, it's kind of, I guess that would be a kind of a growth stimulant, you know, getting that new density in those areas would be pretty nice. Yeah. I I mean, to me is you know, the biggest thing, whether it was, you know, thinking about myself and, you know, kind of, you know, just, we know antiandrogens are just kind of maxed out what they can do and we just need stronger stimulants. Is it a question of can, you know, can these molecules, do they recruit, you know, stem cells? You know, mm. to be active in that area, or if they're truly dormant, do they just need a switch to get turned back on? And I think somewhere, whether it's this interview or otherwise, you know, the feeling was, hey, it'll work for a while, and then you'd have to come back in and and have this done again. So it's like to keep that switch go or keep that recruitment going of these. Yeah, the scoob. I think I heard that too. Yeah, but that's there's probably uh... some. It was like a headache, to be honest, you know, having to go back and forth just to, uh, so, so I, I'm guessing it wouldn't be some sort of topical treatment. Yeah. That's a, yeah. kind of a burden, but Hey, as long as it works, if it does work, then I don't think many people would be complaining too much about that. They would certainly make that sort of sacrifice. Look, I me. shaved my head 20 plus years ago. I'm willing <laughs> to do it again. <laughs> hey, yeah, that would be nice. Maybe, um, uh, I guess can, uh, you know. You can ask to be part of the the clinical trial, and you know, uh, hopefully he can accommodate. Well, I think you, I think you know that I've already emailed them. Oh wow! Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, they they have an area on their on their website of you know areas of interest, and you know, I told them my background, not without getting into all this. Yeah, and you know, absolutely, I'd be I'd be up for that. I'd be a hundred percent curious. Of course, they'll tell me to quit everything else and you know i'll have to have a <laughs> crisis moment <laughs> as to yeah yeah you know, you know, is you know how much faith do i have that i'm getting exactly what i think or or am i in or am i in the placebo group <laughs> oh yeah that that would be that would that would suck you go through all that and then it's like oh you're in placebo damn like oh it, it would have to be like a crossover study where okay you're not going to get this for three months and we're going to watch you but at the end, you are going to get it for the next three months. Okay, you know. Then I mean, we'll which side? Which not. side of that do you want to be on? Right? Like, you want to start out with it, get the gains, oh, yeah. and then watch it leave, and then it's like, damn. Well, that that would be my hope is that um, you know the gains would would stay, and that you know the frequency, you know whatever placebo that they're using just won't have any you know negative effect, mm -hmm. and if it if I was in the right dosage group 
because you know that they've got to test that. There's just I'm I'm just I've got a high level of curiosity just just observing, and I know that there are other groups you know looking at things, you know the but the GT you know product I'm I'm quite curious about as well. I mean, you know how how quickly are they going to bring that along considering the uh, the other product there? Oh, uh, KX eight two blue. Are you looking at KX eight two six or what eight two nine? I think it's yeah, KX eight two six. Yeah, it's somewhat you know. Somewhat failed a bit, but GT comes out or comes out with a good phase two, which we're still waiting for. I think it should be coming out the next quarter. So, you know, starting next quarter, should we should have the results on that or some sort of press conference from uh, Kintor regarding it. But I think if all goes well, that would be a just a tremendous product to have, right? Just getting rid of the androgen receptors in the scalp. I can see that being more effective than an Astride in terms of just just maintenance, to be honest. Just pausing things and allowing the hair follicles to sort of rejuvenate themselves to some extent. But I think Hair Cafe, Kevin at Hair Cafe, he mentioned um, something to the degree of testosterone maybe being a positive growth factor to hair follicles. Mm. And if that's the case, then getting rid of that androgen receptor would be, you know, kind of, uh, you know, shooting yourself in the foot. So it's, you know, that not working could probably change our idea of how hair loss, at least androgenetic alopecia, its etiology, partially how it, you know, actually works. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm very curious because I think your video that talked about Scoob 3 and GT2009, you... You you asked the same question that I said to myself, and that is how important is it for follicles follicles that would let's say scoop three worked, you know, as as it was you know kind of talked about the idea that it would form new follicles and that mm-hmm. you know it would recruit them and you'd want them to develop. Well, you know, part of male matura- maturation relies on androgens. We know it relies on DHT. Maybe there's a whole series of cycles that the hair goes through where it's androgen very dependent yeah and so if you're if you're coming in with an androgen (laughs) receptor you know that just knocks it out maybe it just you know turns into velus hair and it just it doesn't go through that number of cycles that you would want or need it to you know to to reform It, it was just your question there i'm like it's the same one i asked myself like just kudos to you oh hey guys it's me i'm actually editing the video right now but i just want to jump in here real quick i'm going to include the segment of my video that john was referring to so this is a video that i made about i would say nearly a year ago maybe like nine months ago where i was talking about the potential use case if we have GT229 and Scoob3 and how there may or may not be some sort of intricate dance to if Scoob3 works, we can bring back the hair follicles, the dormant ones, but maybe there is some sort of stimulation of the androgen receptor that is required for these hair follicles to come back and start growing normally. But If that's the case, then we may or may not have to modulate the DHT levels in the in the scalp by using something like Dutastride or Finastride. I'm just going to include that segment here real quick so you guys can listen to, you know, that part of the video that John's referring to. So thanks for the compliment, John, and thank you guys for listening. I'm going to jump out now so you guys can listen to that segment and then I'll come back and resume the rest of the interview. One thing I will say is. We don't really know if these hairs would potentially still need the androgen receptor in order to work with SCUBE 3. So this is just my thinking. This is my personal opinion. I think there needs to be some sort of intricate dance between hair regeneration and androgen receptor activity. And it is conceivable that during the regenerative phase, hair follicles might require some sort of stimulation from the androgen receptor to return to their native productive state. Thus, while SCUB3 stimulates hair growth, it might be essential to reduce the presence of DHT during that sort of rebooting process. So using medications like finasteride or even dutasteride, I think is still going to be in play. 
However long that period will have to be, I don't know. I think there definitely will be some more research as the clinical trials for SCUBE 3 continues, as well as for GT229, and hopefully things go well for these two potential treatments. So yeah, once you have your SCUBE 3 turning on your dormant hair follicles, it might be essential to keep taking finasteride and dutasteride because we don't really know if the androgen receptor is still needed to bring back these hair follicles. But assuming that the androgen receptor is still needed, you keep using your scoop 3, bring back your hair follicles, maybe a couple rounds of scoop 3 will promptly bring them back. And then after that, when the hair follicles are there, you target your scalp with GT229 to degrade and remove the androgen receptors, effectively shielding the hair follicle from the miniaturizing effects of DHT binding. And a potential upside that I see here is that once the periodic SCUBE 3 treatment rounds are done for a hypothetical patient, they may only require non-daily, possibly weekly applications of GT229. So in essence, while the prospect of using SCUBE 3 to reawaken dormant hair follicles and GT229 to safeguard them from subsequent miniaturization is enticing, a delicate balance might be required. This balance ensures that the hair follicles receive the necessary stimulation that may or may not be needed through the androgen receptor while they're trying to be rebooted with SCUBE 3, all while taking finasteride or dutasteride to reduce the presence of DHT for those hair follicles that are coming back online, and then after that targeting the hair follicles with GT229 to essentially keep them there. And I think I've been reiterating this point over and over again, but I just want to give the idea of at least how I can see these two medications or treatments going hand in hand and potentially curing androgenetic alopecia. Okay, so that was that particular segment. And now, just to come back in, we're going to resume the interview in three, two, one, let's proceed. Yo, thanks. Yeah, thanks. That's been a while. I think I made that video like a year ago now. I'm not entirely sure. But but yeah, I, I, I'm starting to remember. Yeah, that's... If that is the case, like, for, for me, I've kind of updated my thoughts a bit since then. Particularly, I have the this sort of suspicion that estrogens are more so of a growth factor than testosterone when it comes to, you know, just stimulating the hair follicle or keeping it in antigen longer, I was thinking, okay, if we use GT229 to destroy the androgen receptor, what other way could we signal to the hair follicle to stay in antigen and keep growing? Would we still need to use the androgen receptor to tell the hair follicle to, hey, keep growing hair? And the only reason why I question this is primarily due to uh, Dr., I think his name is Dr. Hamilton, a study on male cast castrates. That Essentially, if males were castrated before puberty, they would never develop androgenetic alopecia. The ones that had mild androgenetic alopecia after puberty who were castrated, they sort of retained to their hair, and in some cases, they kind of grew back some hair. So that makes me question if testosterone is really needed, if androgens are really needed for the scalp hair follicles to develop properly. Yeah. Because I'm assuming a male castrate doesn't have that much testosterone interaction with the hair follicles androgen receptor compared to what we could get out of a GT229, right? Yeah. And if that's the case, then at least to me, I don't think testosterone is really necessary when it comes to, uh, I mean, I don't know, but these things, you know, you're just kind of shooting in the dark sometimes, but I don't think it's really necessary when it comes to stimulating the hair follicle, but I've seen more evidence of estrogens and just, you know, the number of estrogen receptors we have in our hair follicles, it being much more of a growth stimulant, so to speak, right? If you look at the uh, scanning electron microscope of hairs from people of the same race, but if you look at the different genders, it tends to be that you know, women have longer hairs, they're much more wider. And they just stay in antigen longer. And that sort of connection that I see there is, okay, estrogen is certainly doing something to the hair follicle to make it prolong how long, how long it's growing, essentially, right? 
So I'm just I'm just not entirely sold on the whole idea of testosterone being a growth stimulant or a possible growth stimulant for scalp hair follicles. Yeah. Yeah, it, it'll be really interesting to see. I'm I'm curious. I think that there despite all the research and so forth that's gone on over the last even two or three decades, it's just it's not clear. And I think Kevin covered in one of his videos talking about I can't remember if it was IGF or you know some molecule that was different in vitro versus in vivo and just whether or not you know certain molecules might be helpful in one phase and unhelpful in another oh yeah i think i know what you're talking about yeah and it's like how you know is is there you know just certain is the timing of these things you know really important so that you know i don't know if those questions are even close to being you know answered as as part of it but just what is the you know the expression of that again it might it might be it's both helpful and unhelpful and <laughs> we just hope that it's not too you know the the absence of it wouldn't be too unhelpful yeah um, you know to the process yeah there's just so many steps in just the growth pathway right if you're looking at the wind pathway the positive factors that actually go to one building the hair follicle and to the hair follicle actually producing hair. I don't think it's fully enumerated. We kind of have the idea of what's going on. Like this molecule is, is noted for positive growth factor. This one is noted for negative growth factor, right? Um, but there is a degree of like, at what point in what cycle are these molecules relevant? And, that, and I just think that's, you know, where the overall research is. I think the research right now is focusing on how can we develop drugs to effectively target the the wind pathway, and if we can do that in a way that's safe, that's not going to like kill anyone. That that could that could definitely make the difference. I could I think that could probably solve a lot of hair loss conditions. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I I agree. I mean, I think for myself, just reflecting back, the the idea that you know, we had, you know. An asteroid, dutasteride, and again, notwithstanding the issue of legal issues, you know that companies have run into, you know, around developing drugs that we touched on earlier. The idea that just even by accident, somebody wouldn't have found something the way they did with minoxidil, like, yeah. oh, this is great, and we put it into a formulation, and it was super helpful. Like the idea that even by accident, with all the development that's gone on, that that didn't happen in the last twenty years. I still am dumbfounded by. I'm still really surprised that, you know, there wasn't something that, you know, was, you know, 30% better than Rogaine and just really just said, just displaced it in the market and, and didn't have any of the negative, you know, impact, you know, that that might come with androgen-based these treatments that it just came out and, hey, this is the upgrade and, you know, you're off and running. Didn't happen. Nothing. Nobody, like, even by accident. Yeah, I guess there needs to be a few more accidents before we get there, to be honest. <laughs> no, like, I definitely hear you on that. Um, I, I mean, there is vertiporfin, right? Uh, vertiporfin, yeah. originally for, it was for age-related macular degeneration. But then they found out that it could be used to prevent scars, slow down, slow down the, uh, the healing process. Which would lead to scarless tissue, and now that intersection coming into play with hair transplants, it looks like from the case studies from Dr. Bloxham and Dr. Barguthi that you're you're starting to see this sort of different kind of tissue, something that isn't really you know maybe intermediate between scar tissue and normal tissue, but there being signs of hair follicles coming back from those extracted you know donor areas. Honestly, I think that is a very, you know, um, promising sort of treatment that we have read readily on the market because vertiporfin's already been FDA approved. It's being off label, being used off label for this particular, uh, you know, uh, treatment. So, I my fingers are crossed with that. If vertiporfin can significantly improve donor area after hair transplantations, to me that you know, even if it's like twenty five percent, fifty percent can make the difference for so many people but i think it's also the long-term 
observation of, okay, what are those hair follicles doing that come out of that vertiporfin treatment? Are they acting the same? Will they only be around for like two cycles and then, you know, they're gone? I think there's just so many questions that have, have yet to be answered, but uh, certainly I think it's, I think it's promising. I think it's promising. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, I'd be, I'd be so curious to see, even just studying it in a small scale, whether, it, whether you could, A, deliver something, you know, like that, you know, using a derma roller. Oh, yeah. You know, what is, what is the molecular size there? And I'd be really curious, you know, again, put it on this, you know, pluck, pluck velus hair out. Take it out of an area. You know, do that within a one inch square centimeter. Say, okay, you know, we're we're removing these hairs altogether. Now we're going to put in some vertiporfin, and let's see whether or not there's anything to it. Just the mere process of repair going onto the area. Is there any kind of signaling that's going on here? And if you started to see terminal hair come into areas that that there wasn't, I would just be so curious about that because, I mean. You know, is the, is there something to that? And again, would those hairs still have DHT sensitivity? But with our current set of treatments, could those be protected? Yeah. It's like next step that you would see. I'd be fascinated to see if somebody you know tries that out because they would they could do a case series on you know a number of patients and and look at that you know very specifically without it being a, a formal study and just say you yeah, know we're gonna. We're going to try this out. We're going to extract some hairs from areas that are not donor hairs and see if this is stimulative. Definitely. Yeah, I, I hear you on that. For me, it's like I would think that the hair that does come back would have some sort of characteristics to whatever previous, I guess you can say, um, maybe cell lineage that was there before. So the previous hair follicle, maybe there's some sort of stem cell or niche environment that would create recreate a hair follicle that is still somewhat characteristic of its previous yeah. I guess the previous hair follicle that was there before but would it be a much younger hair follicle such that you know it's kind of like the hair follicle version of, of that particular previous hair when you were like let's say 8 years old or something or early development you have this brand new hair follicle that hasn't been really targeted by DHT so it's kind of like taking treatment before you notice hair loss, right? You're, that, that, I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. That If that's the effect of a vertiporfin, right? You get this hair follicle, kind of like you reset the older one that was there before, and now you can take treatment and prevent DHT from interacting with it. So you're, you're pretty much just, I guess, getting a, you know, a more, an earlier version of your previous hair follicle, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. I, I would be I'd be very curious as well to see you know how that might how that might play out. 